Okay, uh, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about uh, the flood as depicted in other stories. Um, now I should mention that there do seem to be flood stories around the world, but these ones are, seem to be particularly more from uh, the parts of the world that we've been looking at a lot, like Greece and Mesopotamia. So uh, there's a good chance they could have been an influence on the Jewish version of the story. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, talk about uh, so, uh, two other versions of the flood story, and we'll kind of compare and contrast um, what we think of all of these. Okay, so switching over to a PowerPoint here. Just a second here. Okay, so previously we looked at the book of Genesis, um, but we actually have uh, two other versions of the flood story, of a flood story, and the book has this wonderful list uh, it's not in the chapter that we looked at, but if you want to check it out, it's on page 183 that compares all three of these stories. Um, and so I'm going to look at each of them in turn. Okay, so let's tell the stories here. So the first one comes to us from Rome, but appears to have also been a Greek story um, of a flood sent by uh, the Greek gods. So I'm using the Greek names for the gods in the source that the book uses for it. Um, Ovid, it uses the Roman names for the gods. Um, but uh, let's go with the Greek names here. So the story is basically that Zeus um, is feeling threatened by human beings. Um, they are angry, they are arrogant, they are violent, and they are uh, impious. Uh, they don't worship the gods uh, correctly. Um, there's a chance that um, they could come and challenge the gods, which they have threatened to do on a couple of points. But more so, the specific thing that sets Zeus off is a guy named uh, uh, Lycon. And Lycon, um, he invites uh, Zeus to his house, um, thinking that Zeus is just a random traveler. Now, in ancient Greece, you're supposed to have respect for travelers. You're supposed to um, you know, really take care of them and not harm them or rob, rob them. And if you do any of that, Zeus will punish you. So Zeus is the god who watches over this sort of thing, which is why Zeus travels around in disguise, because that way you never know if Zeus, if, you know, the traveler you're um, hosting at your house might actually secretly be Zeus in disguise. So there are a couple of stories where he meet, he's treated well, he's treated poorly. In this story, he's treated poorly because Lycon not only tries to kill him and take his money, but Ly Lycon decides that he's going to cook and eat him. And Zeus finds out that Lycon has cooked and killed and eaten people before. And so Zeus says, you horrible cannibal, you. And this is one of the stories that um, seem to suggest that particularly the Greeks are uncomfortable with cannibalism. Maybe there was a cannibalistic group of people that they knew, but they have a few different stories about it that shows that the gods really frown on it and say, that's bad. You don't do that. Um, so Zeus is quite in, in, uh, angry that um, this is happening, and even more angry that it would do people would do that to him. So in the version in Ovid's Metamorphoses, Zeus, also known as Jupiter, um, you know, leaves in a huff and turns Lycon into a creature. So he grows fangs and claws and uh, becomes the first wolf. Zeus says, you know, if you're going to eat people, uh, you might as well be a weird animal that can eat people. Um, and so that's my punishment to you. And this is an ideology for where the wolf comes from. So all that's the background, but, um, and probably originally a different myth, but Ovid uses it to explain um, why Zeus was angry with human beings. Um, so you can see that as an example of wickedness in the same sense as, um, as uh, the uh, wickedness of the people in the story of Noah's Ark. So Zeus decides to destroy a whole bunch of people in a great flood. Uh, he decides to wipe out a bunch of people. But um, the son of Prometheus uh, is a guy named Deucalion. So uh, somehow or other Prometheus, even though he's, you know, chained up and having his eagle, uh, having his liver eaten by an eagle, um, he is able to get a message to his son. And so Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha, who are basically just mortals, um, even though one of them is the son of a god, um, they uh, decide to escape the flood. Now, they don't have a message telling them to um, build an ark. Um, they just have a message that there's a flood coming and you better get out of the way. So what they do is they build a wooden chest. And so they, it's like a coffin. And they just like 
hang out in this box. And uh, when the floodwaters come, they just get knocked around in this box until uh, the floodwaters finally die down. And when they emerge from the box, um, they find themselves on this high mountain. And um, so then they're up on the mountain and then the floodwaters dry out. Um, and they're a little afraid because, you know, understandably they think Zeus might be mad because he was trying to wipe everybody out, all the humans, and they're human. Um, and uh, th of course, uh, Deucalion knows that his father didn't get along so well with Zeus. Uh, so he really wants to make sure things are good. So what do they do? They build an altar to Zeus and they give a prayer to Zeus and they make sacrifice to Zeus and they say to Zeus, we love you, you're great, please don't kill us. And Zeus is like, yeah, all right, these guys seem worth keeping around. They're not terrible. So maybe I will let there be humans after all. Um, but uh, they, they, Ducali and Pyrrha, they're a little concerned because they're the only two humans left. So they look around and they finally find an oracle. Um, and uh, the oracle is a place where you can go and get messages from the gods. Uh, so they go to the oracle, but of course the messages are always kind of cryptic because you wouldn't want a people saying, um, and these oracles did exist in real life. You wouldn't want um, the oracle saying something and it turning out to be wrong. So you got to make it as cryptic as possible. You got to make it kind of a riddle. And then if it doesn't happen, you can just say, oh, you interpreted the riddle wrong. Um, but the oracle tells them, um, you must throw the bones of your mother behind you. Now, this is very confusing to them. But after a long while, they finally figure out that the bones of their mother, or if it's Mother Earth, Mother Gaia, uh, Gaia being described as a mother. So they take stones from the earth and they throw them behind them. And the rocks that Deucalion throws become men and the rocks that Pyrrha throws become women, women. And this leads the way to repopulate the earth. So they don't have to do it themselves. Um, unlike Noah's family who kind of did. Um, these guys, they are just able to bring some new humans to life. who are gonna replace the old ones um, and are gonna be better uh, than the previous generation. And so this is all very interesting. And what I find striking here is that, um, is that it's not too dissimilar from the golden age in a certain way. The, the idea of Zeus being angry with people is something that also appears in some versions of the golden age story. Uh, and also in um, the Trojan War story, the background of that is, you know, Zeus decided humans, there were too many humans and they were too strong. They could challenge him, they could threaten him. And so he was concerned about these powerful heroes. So he decided to wipe them out by having a war. So there's a lot of stories in Greek mythology about this idea of Zeus trying to wipe everybody out. Um, and um, if you think about the historical context of that, it kind of makes sense. Because like we said, when we were talking about the Trojan War, Zeus, um, is representing a, the fact that really people did get kind of wiped out in a way. There was some kind of big end to uh, the old Greek civilization, the really ancient Greek civilization of the Mycenaeans. We don't know exactly what it was, but it might have involved wars, it might have been involved droughts. Somehow or other, the population took a nosedive and the Greeks had to recover. So later Greeks are remembering these stories. So it's not surprising that Greeks would have this idea of everything was destroyed and then we began again, we started all over again. But a story that's even more similar to um, the flood as we know it in, um, in uh, the Noah story, a very similar one is the story, of course, from Mesopotamia. And we've talked a lot about the connections between the Jews and Mesopotamia. And this is one where the connections are absolutely clear to see. So here's the Mesopotamian, Babylonian, uh, whatever you want to call it, version of the creation myth story. Okay, so this is part of a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, but Gilgamesh is not the same person as Noah. Uh, Gilgamesh is not the equivalent of Noah in the story. Uh, Gilgamesh is the main character of uh, this epic, which we're going to look at when we talk about heroes. But it's a common misconception that he's the one who gets in a boat. He doesn't get in a boat. What he does is he talks to the guy who got in the boat. He talks to the guy who survived the flood. And this guy is a fellow named Utnapishtim. So it seems to me like this is another example of that parataxis that... Um, the story of Utnapishtim was one story, and then the story of Gilgamesh was another story. And the person who was writing down the story of Gilgamesh said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there was a cameo from the flood guy? That would be pretty cool. But you can kind of just reduce it down to the story of the flood, because Utnapishtim basically tells Gilgamesh his life story. Okay, 
So um, this is how the story goes down for Utnapishtim. Um, basically, the gods decided together. They got into their council, which is a thing you see a lot in the Mesopotamian stuff. They got into their council and had a discussion, and they decided together to wipe out the humans because uh, the humans were annoying them. And why were the humans annoying them? Because uh, they were being too loud. So again, same exact theme. And I think the gods are a little bit hypocritical here um, if they're going to tell the try and destroy the humans for partying when they did the same exact thing. But you know, it's always the party that you're not invited to. Um, so the gods are trying to destroy humans. But not all the gods are 100% in agreement. They may have voted on this, but that doesn't mean everybody voted the same way. And uh, Enki, also known as Eha, uh, we, we met him before as one of the leaders of the gods and one of the wisest of the gods, sometimes the god of wisdom. He sends a message to Utnapishtim. Now, he's been sworn to secrecy. He's been promised not to tell Utnapishtim. So instead, he just goes over to Utnapishtim's house, and he starts talking to the house and says something along the lines of, hey, uh, Utnapishtim's house. Uh, isn't it interesting that the gods are planning to wipe out human, uh, human beings? Um, and wouldn't it be advantageous for somebody, I don't know who, to like build a boat um, and to give specific dimensions and directions, just like God did to Noah? Um, and so uh, Utnapishtim is, of course, there, and he's overhearing all this thing. Uh, so technically, Enki didn't break his promise. Um, he was talking to the house, um, but he uh, gets Utnapishtim to know how to build a boat. And this boat is named Preserver of Life, which is a pretty, pretty good name for a boat um, that's going to preserve all this life. And what uh, does he tell Utnapishtim's house to do? Uh, he says, despise worldly goods. Um, so, you know, avoid uh, possessions, avoid, avoid being greedy and materialistic, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then he tells Utnapishtim to get on the boat um, with his family uh, with all the animals he can gather, and interestingly, all the seeds he can gather. There's a concern in this one that the plants are going to be wiped out. Um, so Utnapishtim gathers all these seeds, kind of like we were talking about with the idea of, you know, in times of natural disaster, people would try and grab their seeds, their crops for the future. Um, and again, there's this idea of opening up the sky. So you open up the firmament and the waters pour down from the sky. And uh, the gods, you know, they're doing this and they're realizing, uh-oh, we're under the sky. And so they have to flee. So the gods are caught up in their own flood and kind of terrified of it and afraid that they themselves will be destroyed. So it just goes to show even the gods are afraid of some stuff. Um, so they flee up to the tops of the mountains, which are, you know, associated with the gods anyway, the tops of the mountains. So that works. And so they hide out there and avoid the flood. Um, and so Utnapishtim gets in his boat and he stays in the boat for a real long time. Let's see, does it say how long? I don't know if there's a clear um, thing of how long, but it's a while. Um, and so Utnapishtim does the same thing. He rides things out in his boat, and then he sends out three birds. He sends out a dove, a swallow, and a raven uh, to determine whether the waters have dried up and it's uh, safe to return to land. Um, but uh, that's a little bit different from what Noah's doing, but it comes to basically the same thing. Um, and uh, the gods are really regretful that they did all this. They're like, why did we wipe out humanity? Uh, maybe they were sort of um, realized that it was a bad idea when they themselves had to flee from the flood. So they regret their choices. Um, Ishtar, who is the uh, ver a version of the goddess Inanna, um, Ishtar says, oh, why did I do this? Um, uh, you know, I made a mistake. I was too hot-headed. She's a particularly hot-headed god. Um, and so the gods regret doing this, and they're like, well, Utnapishtim and his wife are still alive, so um, let's make it up to them. So they just decide to make Utnapishtim and uh, his wife immortal, which is pretty cool, uh, and explains why um, Gilgamesh was able to meet them centuries later. Um, it also is part of Gilgamesh's story in that Gilgamesh is very interested in immortality. But this immortality was bestowed by the gods as an apology, and this isn't going to help Gilgamesh uh, very much. But uh, yeah, so you have these immortal, uh, this immortal couple, and you had a couple in every story, um, and here the couple is immortal, and here the gods really regret their choices. And it seems like Utnapishtim isn't directly said to be like any to be a good man, but he is told to despise worldly goods. Um, so 
it's kind of like the gods gave him instruction on how to be a good person um, and to not be materialistic. So that might be another reason why he deserves to be saved. But also the gods uh, regret the whole idea of the flood. Whereas with, um, you know, in the book of Genesis, it's more like God uh, had this idea and he was going to do it once and not do it ever again. And then Zeus was like, oh, these guys escaped by accident, but they're praying to me real hard. So I guess I'll spare them. So it's some very different tones here, but three very similar stories and all having to do with sort of um, the goodness or wickedness of human beings, um, but um, in different ways. And let's see. Um, yeah, and, and it always seems to be like the gods end up not wanting to destroy things anymore. They want to create, they want to start again, they want to move on. And the world is kind of wiped out and the slate is wiped clean for a new generation of humans. And in this one, you know, everybody's descended from Utna Pishtim um, and his wife. Um, now, if I was to ask, which of these stories um, do you think was most closely connected to, um, to the flood story in the book of Genesis, which one do you think it is? The one that comes from Greece or the one that comes from Mesopotamia? I think we'd have to go with Mesopotamia, right? A couple of reasons. We've already seen that the Jews were in close cultural contact with Mesopotamia. Um, so there was a lot going on there, a lot of connections there. They were in Babylon. And also, if you think about um, what part of the world has flooding more often? Well, um, well uh, Mesopotamia has a lot of flooding. It has those two big rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. There's a lot of water imagery going on in the story of Tiamat. And Greece, you have rivers, but you don't really have flooding all that often. Um, so it doesn't seem like that story originally came from Greece. Um, uh, they, they might have gotten it from somewhere else. And uh, there isn't actually a whole lot of flooding in um, the Jewish Holy Land either. Uh, it tends to be a thing that happens more in Mesopotamia. And the book even suggests that um, there might have been a time when like the coastline cities got drowned due to like a flood that came from like a flood combined with kind of rising oceans, which is an interesting idea. Um, so they think there may have been some real historical events where cities were damaged or and crops were wiped out. And that makes a lot of sense. That was something that seemed to happen in Mesopotamia to some degree pretty often. So if we were to kind of trace the lineage of this story, it seems like it would have to come from Mesopotamia first and then uh, come to the Jews after that and then finally over to the Greeks. That's what would make the most sense. Um, now, it, it, it was a really big deal when uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh was discovered and this story of Utnapishtim was discovered because up until that point, a lot of people had been taking um, the, uh, the story uh, of Noah as absolute truth. And that isn't to say you can't still do that, but that was more common back then. And, um, and then they discover, you know, so there's this whole other story, which might be older, that comes from uh, this part of the world at the right time period when the Jews would have been there. Um, and it blew people's minds and freaked people out uh, that this story was actually found somewhere else and not just in their own tradition. I think the way they preferred to think about it is that the way Noah told it was the cor correct one. Um, and the way it was told by the Greeks was, you know, well, the Greeks um, had heard about the flood and they kind of misinterpreted it because uh, the Jews knew what was what. Um, but now it seems like the Mesopotamians are the one who knows what's what. So it was a way where people had to reshape their perceptions because they discovered this new myth. So if we compare all these stories, there's a lot of interesting uh, things that we can uh, conclude here. Uh, we've got that connection to Babylonian myth, which also has the flood. Um, we've got some links to Tiamat being this, um, you know, goddess of the salt waters who was ultimately destroyed and pinned behind the sky in, you know, in uh, the story of Utnapishtim, that's what's being let out of the sky is um, all these flood waters that are uh, Tiamat's waters. And, um, and then, uh, let's see. And then, yeah, so we, we can compare this to Zeus destroying the sort of wild heroes. Um, I think it's very interesting that we've got the Nephilim in uh, the Jewish uh, creations, the Jewish destruction story um, that, you know, um, there w it was a time of heroes, but this is kind of barely mentioned, as opposed to the Greeks, uh, you know, they're all about talking about the destruction of the heroes. 
Um, so there's a lot of parallels there. If we compare some things, um, you know, we've got the wickedness of human beings in the Bible. We've got um, Zeus uh, commenting on how he in particular was mistreated. And then in, uh, in uh, the story of Utnapishtim, the gods are just complaining that human beings are too loud. So the gods don't have the moral high ground there. And maybe that's why they regret it more and actually suffer. And it's more silly that they have to kind of escape the story and they get kind of, you know, they fall into their own trap there. Um, uh, who's chosen? Uh, Deucalion and Pyrrha, they're just chosen by accident, right? Um, they are just luck out. They get a warning from Prometheus or just a warning in general. Um, but um, as Zeus doesn't warn them. Zeus um, only decides that they're okay after the fact. So if Zeus had been feeling a little less generous, there might not be human beings anymore, uh, is basically the idea there. Whereas with God, it's specifically Noah is chosen from the very beginning, and then with uh, Utna Pishtim, Ea goes against his fellow gods and sneaks a warning to Utna Pishtim, which is a little bit like Prometheus, um, but the gods very clearly feel like they've done wrong and they have to make it up uh, to uh, Utna Pishtim and his wife. Um, and uh, yeah, so you've got um, the details of uh, causing the storm. In uh, the uh, Epic of uh, Gilgamesh, you have some specific details about which gods are like pulling um, the dams out of the sky and, you know, smashing up parts of the sky to let the floodwaters out. Um, and storm gods get involved, which is only natural. But um, in Genesis, the emphasis is much more on the time that's spent um, rather than what God does. It does mention he opens the windows of the sky, which is almost certainly, you know, taken from uh, the Babylonian uh, version of the story and the Babylonian creation myth. And we got to wonder, like, before this, was there a flood story? Did the Jews, um, before they were living in Babylon, did they have a flood story? Uh, did they have the story of Noah? Um, or did they have something similar to Noah, but they told in a different way? Uh, it's an open question. And then, let's see. Um, yeah, how much is the world wiped clean? Noah brings, uh, brings two of, of every creature or um, seven pairs of the clean and unclean creatures. Uh, Utna Pishtim brings livestock. He also brings seeds. Uh, he brings family. He also brings some people. He brings some craftsmen, although the gods don't make them mortal. So, you know, that seems unfair. But he, <laughs> Utna Pishtim brings his, like, entourage. Um, and uh, Deucalion and Pyrrha kind of survived by accident, and so no one's expected to survive, so things are just completely wiped out. And so that's why, you know, it seems like a very stony world, and maybe that's why they use stones to bring everything back to life. It doesn't say if the plants come back to life, but you presume that they do, because they're still here. Um, in um, Gilgamesh and in Genesis, um, you get the exact dimensions of the Ark, and it is an Ark. Um, in, um, in the Greek version, you have a wooden coffin, or a box of some sort, or a treasure chest, which is much more like Osiris than anything else being stuffed in a box. And there's a story about a woman in Greek mythology who was, um, you know, thought to be unfaithful or uh, something like that. And so, and she got pregnant, but she was really, you know, it was the child of a god, it was the child of Zeus. So her father put her in a box and sent her out to sea. But don't worry, she was found and it all worked out okay. Um, but I wonder if that's an influence there. Um, uh, Blanking on her name, uh, but that's okay. It's not hugely important here. Um, yeah, and just how much the regret happens. I don't think Zeus has ever regretted anything in his life, but he does decide to let the humans stick around. Uh, God says, okay, I'm just doing this once. I'm not doing it again. And it's hard to interpret. Is that regret or not? Um, is, or is it just God only wanted to do it the once? Um, and then in Gilgamesh, the gods definitely regret it, and they are very sorry for what they've done. And they're more like, you know, naughty children than gods who made this important decision to, like, uh, reshape humanity. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and, yeah, a lot of different ways you can compare these stories and think about how they're all interrelated. And other stories, other traditions also have flood stories. Uh, I believe there are flood stories in China and in uh, certain parts of um, Asia, of um, India and whatnot. And I think basically, you know, human beings spend a lot of times around rivers. Wherever you have rivers, you have floods. But here we have some specific connections that we can draw in how the flood story is told. Um, so I think of this sort of desire to have natural disasters 
uh, be a force that comes from the gods. That's where all of this is coming from. And this idea of destruction, though, maybe when everything is destroyed, we can start again and start something new. And if you really believe in the gods, um, then you'll probably have, uh, see that as a good thing and a way to go about it, that, you know, trust the gods, they needed to start things again. On the other hand, maybe sometimes it's just about whatever's the most entertaining and the gods kind of turn into wacky characters um, and um, the gods regret what they've done. So yeah, there's a lot of different angles you can take with it. Um, but I hope that is some food for thought. And as we think about this idea of destruction and destroying everything um, in mythology, um, I think we will start to see that um, destruction always has an aspect of creation with it too. And very often destruction stories happen way back in time back in the very beginning. So let's keep an eye out for that. On the other hand, next time we're gonna talk about Ragnarok and that hasn't even happened yet. So Ragnarok, that's way in the far future. So I will meet you guys um, on a Zoom call for that. And for today, I will see you guys in the discussion question uh, where we'll talk about all these floods.